Welcome to Mark My Words. Tonight I have a great show for you, a very, very good show. We have a magnificent medico whom I guarantee will inform you and absolutely entertain you. I'll be back. I've got a few guests for you this evening, but my first guest you are going to love. Now, let me just put things in context. When I last had Dr. Zoran Beck-Frosky on the show, I got mail from Bendigo and Ballarat to Burke, believe me, because he is an utterly delightful, compassionate man. And I love compassionate people. I think we live in a world where it's so consumed by itself that to see people out there who are doing something for someone else really appeals to me. And I'll do anything to help people like this. So welcome back to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you back after so long. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm very excited to be here today. And uh, thank you for those kind words you've just said about It's me. true. It's true. You're a good person and good people are very, very few and far between these days. Now, you're heavily involved in the Gasnia Foundation. Tell me a bit about it. Walk me through the Gasnier Foundation. Well, when Marc Gasnier was in, was in France playing rugby, uh, his father-in-law, unfortunately, had developed a mouth cancer. It's his father-in-law. And at that stage, uh, we were trying to do our very best to help the poor man, and he needed a PET scan. And a PET scan is a special uh, X-ray which is designed uh, to pick up cancer and the spread of cancer. And at that stage, Marc, uh, after having played rugby for uh, in France and having to play, I mean, won a premiership and played for New South Wales and played for his country, in a sense had done it all, he actually had yet felt he had more to give and more to do for the community, so he, uh, so we, we formed the Gaznia Foundation. And uh, one of our first aims of the Gaznia Foundation was to buy a, uh, a PET scanner for St George Hospital. Now St George Hospital has been trying to buy a PET scanner for 10 years. I mean, 10 years, they needed a PET scanner. This is an X-ray machine that saves people's lives. But, but Zoran, why doesn't the government simply fork out the money for one? That's a good question. Great question. Brilliant question. But it's a shame that hospitals like St George, which, are, which is a trauma unit, by the way, for those that aren't in, in Sydney or New South Wales, this is a critical hospital. If something happens at uh, a Sydney airport or Port Botany, this is the place where people go. So, isn't it? It's extremely Absolutely. important Absolutely. hospital. Absolutely. But that, that goes to, back to the, uh, the way in which St George Hospital was, was formed. I mean, it's formed by a, a local hospital, formed by gov uh, federal government, lo uh, state government, local councils and the community. And this is a classic example of the community getting together to help out the hospital and literally to help themselves. Um, the cancer workload at St George Hospital and Sutherland Hospital is almost the greatest, one of the greatest in the whole of Sydney. And basically not to have a PET scanner between the airport and Canberra between the airport and Canberra, no pet scanner, no public pet scanner between the airport and Canberra. I mean, that's... Um, that's it's insanity in a first world country. It's insanity. So, um, so the foundation was set up to raise money. How much do one of these things cost? Uh, $3.5 million whoa, uh, is the cost, basically. Whoa, we're in the wrong business. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and so far we've raised uh, a total of almost half a million dollars. And the, uh, the New South Wales government has given us a pledge of $350,000. But it's, uh, it's the community that's been fantastic. I mean, the community. For example, we formed this uh, Australian Macedonian Medical Society, which I'm the founding president. And we recently had a function on February 24, which raised, uh, was it 400 Macedonians raised $100,000 in one night. That's an astonishing figure. And I had this idea, I thought, hang on. Did, just... you, did you expect to raise that sort of money? No, no way. I mean, basically, I thought, you know, if we get you know, 20 or 30 grand, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be lucky. Um, but basically, we had $100,000 in one night. And Mark, what I thought was, I thought, who lives in the St George area? I mean, we've got Macedonians, we've got Greeks, we've got Lebanese, we've got Indians, we've got Chinese, and obviously Australians, you know, and, and which, I, I, which I am. And basically, I thought to myself, well, hang on, why don't we set up a, a, a scenario where we get the Macedonians have a night, and the Greek night will be in, uh, in May, uh, sorry, sorry, in April. The Lebanese night is actually happening in May, and then we're working on to the two other communities in the future. And so it's constructive competitiveness between the communities to help themselves. And uh, I must admit, look, it all goes back to the gas. I mean, uh, he's an incredible kind of person. He's a really good guy. Um, he, 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 if you ever need help, for anyone needs any help, um, he'll basically just stop, um, do what, anything, anything necessary to help um, uh, anyone in any way that he possibly can. He's, he's a, a good human being, he really is. So let's get someone in who can tell us exactly what a PET scanner is and how valuable it is to the community. I thought it's important that we find out exactly what a PET scanner is. We all he we hear them spoken about, uh, but let's find out what one is. So I've got with me Dr Patrick Butler from, from St George Hospital. Welcome to the show, Dr Butler. What is a PET scanner? OK. A PET scanner is basically a bit of equipment that we use to find cancer nowadays. Uh, we use a thing called positrons, and that's what a PET scanner stands for. It stands for a positron camera. 
And the interesting thing about the positron is that we can stick this positron to a molecule as a tag so that when the molecule that we're interested in goes through the body, we can then follow where it goes and where it ends up. Now, the molecule we're most interested in is sugar, just ordinary sugar. What we do is we put a positron on the sugar, we inject it into people and we see where it goes. What happened maybe about 15 years ago was that people started to realize that cancers, certain cancers, not all, but a lot of cancers, are hypermetabolic. That means they suck sugar out of the bloodstream and concentrate it because they're very, very active bits of, of tissue. When we put the, the molecule into somebody, we basically scan them and we find cancer. And this is where the big advance in PET scanning is about. It's not used so much when finding where the cancer is when people first get it, but it's very, very important to properly what we call stage a patient when they do have the cancer. And there's been research done here in Australia that shows that about 40% of people, when they first present with cancer, will have a different stage after they have had a PET scan. Not only is it important sort of for staging, but it's also really important to find out how well patients respond to the therapy. It's a very, very good technique to find out whether people are responding or not responding. And there's also a lot of work to, sh to show that you can change therapy while they're having the therapy to try and get a best result. So, Patrick, what, what type of cancers? Does it apply to all cancers? No, it doesn't apply to all cancers, but it applies to the most common cancers. Uh, the common cancers are like uh, lung cancer, colon cancer, head and neck cancer, esophageal cancer, lymphomas, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, a whole lot of cancers. And what is the prognosis for someone who has used a PET scanner compared to someone who hasn't? Well, the idea is that it's not so much... It's very hard to change prognosis, but it gives you a better idea of what stage they're at, whether they're at the early stage of disease or the advanced stage of disease. So, in other words, it, it directly affects treatment, I it guess. It directly affects treatment, and it can be changed in about half the patients who have a PET scan, the treatment is changed. So, which would lead, I guess, to, to better outcomes, ultimately. That's what we think. And not only does it have better outcomes, but also the need for more extensive surgery is sometimes stopped so that people don't have surgery that we find out we, they probably shouldn't have had, and then we can also tailor their, th their therapy to a better therapy so that they, you might be combining some chemotherapy and radiotherapy to tailor it to the individual patient. So, Well, that's exactly what happened with Mark Gazzini, his father-in-law. He had the mouth cancer and he was about to have a 10-hour operation to remove this massive cancer from his mouth until he had the PET scan, which unfortunately, God forbid, showed that cancer had spread elsewhere, which was not detectable by any other X-ray machine, and that operation was cancelled, and so he saved him three months of a horrendous uh, life, um, and he had a, a peaceful uh, ending, um, and that directly classic example of how the PET scanner is, is, is so important. That's a really good example because, in other words, uh, the, the, the outcomes uh, hasn't necessarily changed, but the quality of life has definitely changed. Exactly. Which is a huge question these days. Well, uh, in America, I mean, the, when they for all have their cancers, they all get a PET scan. My colleagues in America tell me all have their cancers get a PET scan. And that's, that's the, the trend is that sort of, it's, the more you use it, the more you find out that it, how good it is. And this is only at the beginning of, of, of the, the technology. Not only can you label the sugar, you can also label molecules to detect dementia, to find out whether people have had good heart responses from heart attacks. The, the field is just exploding. So and I just think of PET scan as cancer. I associate the two, so obviously not. And th that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's going to get more and more traces more molecules that we can label with these positrons means that more images that we can take for heart disease lung disease kidney disease and also for big brain disease and if the quality of scan is changing is that technology moving forward as it well it certainly is it's, it's 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 getting better and better the radiation dose is lowering it's changing all the time because there's such a clinical need i'll be back after this very very short break with more medical talk Welcome back to Mark My Words, I'm Mark Barbaluk and my very, very special guest tonight is Dr Zoran Bekvarovsky from St George Hospital. Not only an ear, nose and throat specialist, but a very compassionate man. And tonight we're talking the Gaznia Foundation, which does a lot of good, doesn't it, Zoran? Absolutely. Does some fantastic uh, work and the whole point is, is to raise money for a PET scanner for St George Hospital. Now, the Macedonian community recently had a very, very big fundraising night which was exceptionally successful, wasn't it? Absolutely. You raised how much? $100,000 in one night. $100,000 and how much did you expect to raise? 
40, 50 thousand dollars we were laughing. That's good. That's good. These people are doing good. Now, on the night, the community got together. Mark Gasney was there. Uh, the Macedonian community was there, and also a very, very special young lady by the name of Jenna, Jenna. Goggins. Jenna Goggins. Now, what do we know about Jenna? Well, Jenna and I met the same way you and I met. I took Jenna's tonsils out. <laughs> and I was quite surprised. As you uh, do. As you, that's how I make all my acquaintances. This is stuff because I remember you. On the operating table. Because I remember you took my tonsils out. Let's hear Jenna's story in her own words. I'm 26 years old and I'm here tonight to share my experience regarding having a PET scan and how I strongly feel the need for a PET scan at St George Hospital. Just over 12 months ago, I was enjoying life, working and renting at a unit in, with Kiriwi with a five-year-old son, Jackson. For some time, I was feeling unwell and could not get to the bottom of it. After seeing several doctors and having some tests done, it was put down to an overactive thyroid disease. And I thought that was the answer, but it was not. It soon became apparent to my parents that I was struggling with my health I had become very concerned and convinced me to move home with them and my son. Within days of moving me back home, my condition became worse and my parents presented me at Sutherland Hospital in a psychotic state. It would take the energy of my parents, brothers, sisters and my closest family and friends to keep calm and still as the days went by, my parents had no answers. My parents, knowing me better than anyone else, knew there was something more to my behaviour and requested further tests be done. My parents have no medical background. They are just like so many people here tonight. A week had passed by this stage. An abdominal CT scan was done, which revealed a large mass on my left adrenal kidney gland and it was decided that I dis discharged from Sutherland Hospital and admitted to St George Hospital where a fantastic team of surgeons had the expertise for treating this kind of tumour. But for them to do so I had to have several more scans including a PET scan and this was not possible at St George Hospital because they don't have one. By now it had been a few weeks and I had lost the ability to eat and drink and was losing weight rapidly. The amazing team of surgeons at St George Hospital were ready to operate. They had theatre time and operating rooms ready, but they needed the PET scan. Their way through, to navigate their way through the maze of tumour that had now taken over my body. The only way I could get a PET scan was to be discharged from St George Hospital, travelled by ambulance with an intensive care doctor to Liverpool Hospital, admitted to Liverpool Hospital, have a PET scan done under general anaesthesia, stay overnight and have an MRI done the next day, again under general anaesthesia because I could not stay still. With the scans finally being done, I had to be discharged from Liverpool Hospital and readmitted into St George Hospital with the discs of the scans given to my parents to give the awaiting doctors at St George Hospital that evening so they had the time to study them before under, I underwent surgery the next morning. From the time that it was discovered, I had a tumour on my adrenal gland until the time I eventually had a PET scan done. A further 14 days had passed and each of those days my condition became more and more crucial. I have been able to return to work on a casual basis and best of all see my son go to school. I have recently had further MRIs and yet another PET scan which I had to travel to RPA to get. Unfortunately some of the tumours have returned and I will be undergoing surgery next Friday. I'm so blessed to have such amazing doctors and a wonderful team at St George Hospital. But doctors do need the support of the technical equipment like a PET scan to help them do their jobs and help so many people out there, especially in the St George Illawarra region, as it is such a big area and certainly a growing one. I think with my experience, it is essential to have a PET scan 
in St George Hospital because people in severe cases who need to get this test done or they wait too long for the test and by then it's too late. I would hate to see anyone go through what my family and I have been through in order to get much needed PET scan. Please help our dedicated doctors, nurses and surgeons at St George Hospital so they can ultimately help each and every one of us because you never know what happens. John, I'm fascinated to know how did the Macedonian society, the community, get involved with all this fundraising? Well, Mark, basically, um, I'm fortunate enough to form the, uh, the Australian Macedonian Medical Society uh, approximately two years ago, and that's basically a bunch of uh, Macedonian doctors and medical students and dentists and pharmacists and audiologists that we basically got together um, to, to help our community somehow. And the obvious, there's a no-brainer, when I was part of the Gazdian Foundation and being the founding president of the society, I thought, hang on, what can we do to help the community? And the obvious thing was, how can we help the community in, in Sydney, uh, in where we live, through helping the community itself. Now, you recently had the Macedonian president. He was out in Australia, wasn't he? Yeah, we were fortunate to have the, uh, the, the, uh, the president of the Assembly of the Macedonian Republic, and he came to visit us at our hospital, at St George Hospital. He also saw where the PET scanner's gonna live, and he was um, thrilled to, to learn um, of how, of how uh, how the Macedonian community is doing in Australia. And also, he was very pleased to learn that, that the Macedonian uh, people in, the, in our community are quite respected and they're quite nice people. And um, the community, the, the non Macedonians, actually respect and, uh, and like, like. Macedonian. Was he astonished to see how large and how organised the community is? Yeah, he was. He really was. Because it is, it is pretty amazing. Yes. How, how Australia's developed along those lines as part of our multicultural society. The fact that you do have quite coherent social groups mm. like your own, and you're doing something with it. And what sort of things did you do on the evening? Well, basically, we, uh, we raffled off a hundred and twenty thousand dollars Mercedes. You raffled off a Mercedes, <laughs> okay? Uh, and we had a second prize of a, a Channel Nine uh, twenty thousand dollars advertising package, and a third prize was a uh, the local leader newspaper gave us a five thousand uh, dollars advertising package, and also a massive painting of Marilyn Monroe. Um, we had um, silent auctions, we had other raffles, and we even had Mark Gaznia dancing to a song that I composed called the, When the Saints Go Marching In Macedonian Style. I performed the whole thing, so what you hear is basically me doing it, uh, me doing the whole thing, and uh, it's my composition. And... and are you using the accordion, the squeeze box? I'm um, using key keyboards, yes. There's, a keyboard, there's an accordion um, segment in it, but it's basically... Uh... But you play the accordion, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I've done a lot of music over the years, and um, yes. And, and do you still play the accordion? Oh, I can, when I get some time. Well, when you get some time, hang on, between everything else yeah. you're doing, I, I can't see how you can possibly humanly fit that in. Oh. So, Beck Prosky, you, you are an incredible human being. Your energy is very, very inspiring and life-affirming to see it. And it's a shame there aren't enough people out there. But look, before we wrap up tonight, this is really, really important, please tell me the website for the Gaznia Foundation. Yes. Uh, www.gazniafoundation.com.au gazniafoundation.com.au So people can get on that, find out what you're about, contribute, yes. throw in their ideas, become a part of it. This is a good man, this is a good foundation, they need your help. A very big thanks to my two guests tonight, Dr Patrick Butler from, from St George Hospital and Dr Zoran Beck-Vorosky, a man who famously once held a knife to my throat while I was unconscious, like many women in my life would love to do.